Please welcome our speaker, Mr. Kyle Shutter, International Partnership Manager of Beta Retail. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the warm introduction. Um, indeed, uh, my name's Kyle. Easy to remember, it rhymes with smile. And uh, I work at this company called Beta. You can see we have a number in our name. We ran out of letters. So uh, we uh, have some interesting retail stores, which I'd like to tell you a bit about, and also interesting case studies we've developed along the way. And why should you trust what I say about how these things work in retail? Uh, you shouldn't really trust what I have to say at all. You should make your own opinion. But I think you'll find something interesting today. I'm going to start off with suggesting that retail is broken. I think we all can agree that uh, retail is not currently going the way it should. You can see how most uh, brick and mortar stores are actually kind of going down the drain. And as a startup, as a hardware company, it's really hard to get your products into retail. You know, um, you can see even if, if you're a great company like Microsoft, you probably don't have the greatest experience in retail. It's kind of a bit gaudy, really. And if you're a hardware startup, you're very lucky if you even get, you know, this little tiny display right down here, right? If you're uh, a hardware startup, you're, if you're lucky. Um, and the other option is Amazon, which is, uh, the mar margins are better. But to be honest, the experience, it's not really there. This is my, I was searching for um, this Epico, and I wanted to try it out, but I couldn't. Why? Because it's on Amazon. It's going to take me two days to receive it. So this really isn't working. So what we've done is we've tried to reinvent what retail can be um, because we've seen that 78% of people actually prefer to shop in the store. Not necessarily buy, but shop, right? So this is the store we built. This is our store in Seattle. And you can see people are milling around. Um, this is our store in uh, LA. And you can see all the products are out of the box. It kind of looks like an Apple store, right? Yeah, it's kind of like an Apple store. But it's for anyone. Anyone can be in our version of the Apple store. And we like to have events, too. So here's you know, a bunch of people coming for an event. We like to have wine and beer. Products are great, but it's about the experience around it, right? People don't buy Coke to get sugary uh, um, dark soda. They, get, they buy Coke to have happiness. So they come to buy products here. They're not just buying a... Um, smart door lock, they're buying access to their home and to their friends and family to come in. Here's another picture of our store. Again, each product has an iPad next to it to just explain how it works. And all this will make sense as to how we can develop some case studies around these products in retail. Here's another product, a bike. I mean, you definitely want to try a bike before you buy it, right? You can't just like look online and say, oh, I want that bike. No, you need to really try that out. So this is a customer trying out our bike. Again, uh, more uh, photos of our store. Um, and then so that's, this is really how customers discover your product. But what if you want to discover your customer? What do they like? What do they not like? How many people are you getting? Things like that in retail stores, you just don't really get. So we have a, a dashboard where you can actually see how many people come to your specific display. Not the store, your display. Right? So you can see how on every day how many people came and how many sales you had every day. If you're in Best Buy, it's hard to know if you run a Facebook campaign on Monday, did that help your sales on Monday? Because you're going to get a new purchase order in 90 days, right? And so you don't really know when those sales actually happen. Is a Facebook campaign effective or not? And so here's our another store. And you can see in the ceiling we actually have cameras. So that's how we know. We're actually, it's like Minority Report. We can actually see people come in the store. And the crazy thing is we can even figure out a lot of data about them. Here's some examples. We know about 57% of people coming in the store are male. Average age is 34. Um, and then from their email address, so when we give a receipt, we don't actually do it by paper. We ask for their email, and then we email it to them. And this is kind of crazy, and I'm not sure if everyone here knows this, but if you've ever signed up for a credit card in the US, you give away all this information, right? If you're married, if you have a house, how much money you make. So for not very much money, we can actually find out 
once you have their email address, who they are. So now you know, oh, my customer, I thought it was male, but it's actually female. I thought my customer um, made this amount of money, but they actually make this, right? And then here you can change your display in real time so you don't have to wait for something to be printed. And five minutes later, if you're in Shenzhen, you can change your display in LA. Here's what the display looks like, and here's the display with the product. This is for Ring and Doorbell. And then the way this all works, the way this business model works is we take 0% margin. Not 3%, not 18%, not 50%, not 60%, zero. Zero margin, so 100% of revenue from sales actually goes to makers. What we do is we rent out space in the store. So typically it's around 1,000 a month, but depends on different locations, right? Different real estate. And so that's how that business model works. Um, and this is gonna be important for this next step. All right, this will be fun. So I wanna talk now about the fog of retail. Maybe you've heard of fog of war before. If you're in war, and you're in the trenches, you don't really know where the enemy is, you don't know what's going on. Afterwards, historians write books about it, case studies, but when you're in the moment, you have no idea what's really going on and where they're coming from. And this picture looks kind of tame, but retail's not like this at all. Retail is much more like uh, this right here. Oops, wrong button, there we go. It's much more like this, this is retail. This is the, this is the fog of retail. So here's the startup and competition's coming from every angle, getting shot with arrows, bloodied and bruised. It's not really clear who's the friend and who's the foe and if they're gonna get through it. And this is what happens in retail. So a lot of the things like, how many sales did you have on a specific day? You can't really know in traditional retail or who your customer is. Another way to look at this is, here's all the things you could know. Here's what you know. Here's what you know you don't know, right? So the things that you, you know are like, you know how much cash you have in the bank, right? Hopefully you know how much cash you have in the bank. The things you know you don't know are you don't know how many sales you'll make this year. But the rest of this area of things you might know is what you don't know you don't know. And that's what really trips you up and that is the fog. And so as beta, we're trying to really uncover what's going on there. All right, so here's, here's a case study. This is a product that is in beta, it's called Hudway. They raised half a million dollars on Kickstarter. I think very respectable. They were selling for $40 a unit. And the way this works is there's it's a heads up display. You place your phone here and it projects your driving directions. It's pretty cool. They also have a subscription part, so you buy your software every year, so they have recurring revenue, which I think is a very smart play. And they started, they launched in beta, and they launched at $80, so you can see here in the graph, it was $80, uh, $79.99. And their sales weren't that great. But because of our model, we said, okay, that's not working well, let's try a different video. That didn't really change much. So we tried a few different things, and eventually we said, why don't you just change the price? It was $40 before, now $80, let us do something in the middle. $60. Bucks. So they reduced their price by 25%, and their sales increased by seven times, actually. Seven times. So that was pretty interesting, and this was something they didn't know they didn't know. This is the fog of retail, if you will, right? And now they had to decide, now what do we do about our bill of materials costs? Um, how do we make this all work, knowing that this is the right price point for our product? Here's another product we have in our store. It's a smart pen, you write, and then everything syncs to the cloud. Um, and this was the original display we had where the pen is open, it's very elegant, I think I like this display a lot. It's on top of this book. And to be honest, the sales weren't bad, they were just, they were fine. We thought, let's see if we can improve it. What else can we do? So we tried a few things, and what really worked was a less elegant display where the book is actually open and there's drawing all inside the book. Which it doesn't look as nice, but what we found out was their sales increased substantially around 50% and they kind of stayed there. So that was interesting, a less elegant display but more sales, which was kind of the objective of being in the store, right? So Nest thermostat, anyone heard of Nest before? I think everyone's probably seen a few Nests before. And this is, this is their second generation product. Uh, this is not a case study from 
our store, but this is before actually our founders came from Nest. And the story was they tried getting Nest into retail stores. It was so difficult. They said, let's fix this. Let's start our own store where it's easy to get set up and make a beautiful display. Anyway, this is a second generation product and Nest was seeing they were getting lots of returns. And they couldn't really figure out why they're getting returns. So they dug into it. After a few months, they found out people said it was broken. And they're like, that's weird. Because when we test it, it works. So they dug a little further and they found out people said it was broken because it was cracked. Can anyone see from this picture why someone might say it's cracked? I think you can see, yeah. There's like a line right here. So that's actually the IR sensor and the glasses on the top part. But people would bring it in, say it's cracked, they'd get a new one. The new one was cracked, cracked too, right? And then they'd say, I give up on Nest. You know, these guys don't know what they're doing. So Nest said, okay, what we're going to do, we'll put a little sticker there that says IR sensor removed. They did that and they didn't have that problem anymore. But this is the fog of retail. They did not know that someone would think that was going to be cracked. But for a company with less cash flow, it could have destroyed them. Luckily, it didn't. And from their third generation, you can see, I hope you can see that it clearly is not cracked. There's some vents on the bottom that uh, it clearly shows that it's not cracked there. Uh, anyone familiar with this product? This is a Karma drone from GoPro. Somewhat ironically named. I think if you name anything Karma, you're, you're flirting with something dangerous there. But here's, here's the headline recently. It says, GoPro is relaunching its Karma drone after an embarrassing recall. The company had to recall the product soon after its launch last fall because the drone would lose power and fall from the sky. That's a little scary. Um, a little scary headline. So what happened was they immediately launched throughout the U.S., sold tens of thousands of units, and fall from the sky. I mean, that's kind of an extreme, and it's kind of, you get people to click on, it's a clickbait kind of uh, link, right? Um, and a few of them lost power and they fell. Not that many. But still, they had to recall all of the units, um, which is a very expensive thing to do. And if they had just rolled out slowly, that would have been a much better way where they could have controlled and said, okay, one in 100 units has some power issues, let's deal with this, and then let's, re let's launch again. It was very expensive, obviously. And I was talking with uh, Bay at Brink recently, and he says what they advise their companies to do out of Kickstarter is don't launch to everyone, all the backers at the same time. Launch to a market that is not, there's not going to be a lot of news about it, so if there's any problem. So launch to Singapore, launch to Hong Kong, wait six weeks, figure out what's wrong, then you know, launch to everyone. You can come up with some excuse like, oh, it's a closer market or whatever, but launching slowly is, is probably a good way to go. Um, which in traditional retail is not really possible. Once you go to Best Buy, they're like, okay, you're going in a bunch of stores, and we're not going to tell you which ones necessarily, we decide. Uh, so that's a pretty dangerous way to go about it. I want to talk a little bit about uh, first principles in retail uh, from what we have seen, what we've learned. And the way we think about customers is what do they care about when they shop? What kind of place do they want to be? Like fundamentally, what do customers want when they shop? And fundamentally, what we found is there's four um, things. Price, assortment, convenience, and experience. The acronym is PACE. And they roughly care about these things in this order. So think about a store that has the best price. Amazon, right, would be a store that has the best price. Convenience uh, or assortment. Amazon has great assortment. Also, if you go to a great speaker store, they have great assortment there for that one small niche. Convenience, I can't think of anything better than 7-Eleven. On every single street corner, you'll find a 7-Eleven there. Like, you don't even have to go down a block to find one. It's just going to be there. And experience, of course, uh, Apple Store. Few have been able to compete with Apple Store on experience. But people, some people prefer to shop in different locations and some for different kinds of products. If you're trying to sell hot dogs, um, what's the most important thing? Probably it's convenience. 7-Eleven's great at selling hot dogs. If you're trying to sell hot dogs through Amazon and you have to wait two days, I'm going to be starving by the time the hot dogs show up. You know, that's not going to work. Um, and is anyone here, just by a show of hands, how many people here are, uh, have their own hardware company or are part of a hardware company? 
Just raise your hands if you are. All right, great. Um, what, um, what product are you selling? Yeah, sure. What? Robot arm. Okay. Uh, B2C or B2B? Okay, both. So what do your customers care most about in terms of these? Price, assortment, when they're shopping? Do they want to know there's a bunch of different robot arms? Yeah, so there's different things like the, the customers, thank, thank you so much, thank you, thank you. Um, so there's things that they care about the product itself, but also about the shopping experience, right? So they might, um, when they want to decide, so the price is like very high on their list of things they want to do. So you want to find channels that are appropriate for that product, right? So what channel is appropriate for your product because it, it focuses on one of these things. If you're selling really nice speakers, you need a place Great assortment and great experience, probably. All right. Um, now, I want to ask a question. What, what percent of U.S. retail sales do you think are e-commerce? 50%? 90%? So typically, people think that e-commerce is really big in the U.S. It is big, but it's not as big as you might think. Actually, only about 9% of retail sales in the U.S. are... Um, Online. What was your guess going to be? 20%? Yeah, we're pretty good. Pretty close. Not yet. Um, so really, if you're looking to sell your products, you really have to be in physical stores. So Amazon's not really enough on its own. Uh, here's one of our partners ran this study on their customers and said, where have you seen our product in the last three months? And here's all the different options. And the most important one, as it turned out, was in a store. So even while people are pushing to be online and sell there, the margins are great, yes. But in terms of marketing value, being in a store is really important. Uh, there's other things here like um, you know, recommendations, friend's house. It's hard to see something at a friend's house unless you already get it out the door. Yeah, so really being in a store is really important for uh, a lot of companies. Um, and if we look at a price of a specific product at different kinds of stores, at Amazon, it might be $100, eBay 106, Walmart 119, Target 129, Best Buy is somewhere in there, probably around 120. So what happens in stores is people, they see it in physical retail and then they buy it on Amazon. One of our partners actually, uh, they, when they, the month they launched in Best Buy, they actually doubled their Amazon sales. Doubled, doubled their Amazon sales. Um, and that's because Basically, Best Buy provided free marketing for Amazon. And this is why Best Buy slowly, it's kind of, it's slowly dying, you know? Uh, because unless they figure out how to capture value for that marketing that they provide, um, you know, they're really, they're really getting destroyed on sales. Uh, and here's another look at Amazon and how big they actually are in e-commerce. So last holiday season, 70% uh, of online sales happened on Amazon. And the next biggest after that is Best Buy at 4%. So they're just huge, Amazon is huge. So as a startup, thinking about which channels you want to go through, you think about price, assortment, convenience, and experience, which of those is best, but also who's gonna drive the most sales for you? Um, yeah, another thing that's interesting on the chart as well is looking at Apple and Macy's have the same online sales, yet Macy's has so many more SKUs and much lower margins. So you can see exactly how, you know, Apple, why Apple's doing well and Macy's is not. So as a maker, what should you do? That's the whole mess of things I've just shared with you. Uh, here's an example from Tile. Also a product that's in beta. Here's their display on the top right, and it's a tracker for your keys. Everyone, I think, is aware of Tile, probably. Um, and this is, so the display works very nicely. They're selling very nicely in beta, because someone can just try it, and be like, oh yeah, I can see how it's relevant to my life, and I lose my keys, let me get one. So they launched uh, 2013 on Kickstarter, raised $2.6 million. A year later, they shipped to backers. Um, a few months later, they launched on Amazon. So that was the first place they launched, recognizing that's, um, in terms of price, that's a great place. Also, there's lots of people who are there. And then, um, 
they launched in uh, Best Buy, Lowe's, Target, and Beta a year later. So usually it takes a whole year to get into physical stores. This is very typical of make for makers. And they launched in beta mostly then just because that's when we opened our store. And now typically we launch products in beta the same month we, they launch on Amazon. So they launch simultaneously in the same place. And then, then they raised a nice round after that. So good for them. Um, so here's the uh, last few thoughts I wanted to share which hopefully will be useful for you in building out your business plan, financials, things like that. If some of these numbers feel very round, it's because they are. There's not, it's not like clear cut exactly what these things are until beta is you know, throughout the US. We don't know all these numbers very precisely, but around here is what you're looking at. Um, so pricing is the most important decision you'll make in your product. It says who can afford it. As you saw before, it can dramatically change your sales. 25% change in price can increase your sales 7x in that one product, and that's probably not an extreme case, even. Um, it also determines how much you can spend on your bill of materials and uh, you know, how much you can spend on marketing. Budget 15% of your gross profit for uh, reverse logistics and customer support. People don't realize, and you, even early on, it might be even more than that. Uh, Smart home return rates are typically 20 to 30 percent, and a lot of companies coming out uh, out the door don't realize how how high that can actually be. Um, we've 70 percent of your uh, income does come in Q4 in the U.S. Americans just love to shop around Christmas and then um, you know give to people. So if you miss Q4 and you start shipping in Q1 instead of the next year, you're going to miss out on a really huge opportunity. Um, of course, you don't want to ship a product that's immature, but that is a really important uh, a step there. Um, we've seen a lot of successful hardware brands often lose money on the hardware or even break even, and they make up for it in subscriptions and software and things like that. So things like Dropcam, companies like the other company, Hudway, where they have this physical device they sell, and then they, every year they sell $5 worth of software that goes with it, right? So I, I get really nervous whenever I see companies especially on Kickstarter, they say, no subscription fees ever. Uh, that's, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to keep that promise, and I'm not sure it's one they should keep. If they charge subscription fees, that's a really nice alignment of interest between you and your customer. Your customer wants you around. And it's a good way for you to you know, make money and also reduce the cost of your hardware that you can sell to, to customers. Uh, and last, uh, the abandon rates typically are 50%. So think like Fitbit, um, like you know, the smart pen really pretty high, so if you're doing better than that, that's great. If it's worse than that, that's kind of a problem. You don't want someone saying, oh yeah, yeah, Fitbit, I got one of those, and they're like, oh yeah, how's it work? Uh, you know, I never, I never put it on, it's still in the box. Uh, you know, it's not really an inspiring story to give her for a referral, right? So I hope this uncovered some of the fog of retail that a lot of you know, manufacturers, makers, brands don't really get to see about what's actually going on on the ground. Um, and uh, I'm very interested to uh, hear from uh, any of you if you have any questions. And you can also very much feel free to email me anytime. So thank you very much.